uh, planning board has six members here, so we have a quorum also. All right, we have a quorum of both bodies. Um, I would um, uh, announce to everybody present and everybody online that uh, this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, the uh, next thing on the agenda is uh, public comment. Um, we, I don't know if we anybody signed up, um, but we would uh, entertain public comment. Um, please uh, be respectful. We're not running a, a I'm not running a, a clock tonight, but um, we'd ask you to keep your um, uh, comments to uh, two minutes. Um, and uh, and uh, if you go on too long, we will ask you to, if you go past two minutes, we'll, we'll ask you to wrap it up. Okay. Council Elkins? Yes. I just want to note this would be for items not on the agenda. All right. right? Um, yeah, so because what is on the agenda is a public hearing, um, if you are here to speak about the 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 joint portion, anything that's here on the agenda item for either the joint portion or the planning board, uh, we'd ask that you save your comments for those um, parts of the hearing. Um, but the floor is open to um, to general public comment about other things. Anybody present wish to speak? Okay, anybody on line, anybody on the Zoom? Okay, and just uh, for those folks, if you can't see, um, I'm not seeing um, I'm not seeing anybody online. So uh, I will move on from the public comment um, portion. Uh, so the next on the um, item, uh, the next agenda item is the joint portion, uh, the joint portion of the meeting, which is a public hearing on the proposed zoning change, um, uh, and. Uh, could I have a motion to hear open the um, public hearing? So moved. Second it. All right. Uh, we can vote by consent by or voice vote because uh, everybody is here. Uh, so uh, all in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Uh, any? No, I hear none opposed. Our, our parliamentary kind of protocols are. Our... <laughs> We don't normally uh, make a motion to open the hearing. We'll certainly just abide by your your motion if the public hearing is open once the chair kind of says, here we are at a public hearing. All right. so our parliamentary protocols are a little bit different than the city council's. Fair enough. All right. So uh, the hearing is open um, for a hearing on proposed zoning amendments um, uh, re regarding rezoning parcels uh, 23A, 20, uh, 286, 291, and 23C0, 37, 38, from general industrial to office industrial, and uh, to rezone parcels 23A tw through 27A, 279, 280 from OI to URB and 23A through 287, 288, 289, 290 from general industrial to urban residential B. Um, so uh, I would ask, why don't we start with uh, Carolyn? Sure. Um, good evening. So I'm going to do a screen share of the um, zoning amendment and walk through that. I'm going to make sure it pops up. Okay, so, um, and I'll just zoom in on the the map a little. Let's just, um, so this area is um, the, the portion of Florence, just south of Florence Center um, along, so Pine Street is sort of on the upper edge of this um, graphic and Nonatuck is on the lower edge where all the brightly colored boxes are. <laughs> um, and the proposed amendment would rezone a pocket of office industrial, which are um, a series. Um, so there's two parts of this, one to rezone the, the portions that are industrial and zone general industrial to an office industrial use, and then um, rezone industrial parcels that are residential uses currently into the urban residential B zoning category um, while we're making these shifts to a different um, general industrial, I'm sorry, industrial zone. And 
the as you can see, sort of before I go into the rationale, the existing office industrial is just to the west of the parcels that are shown GI to OI. So um, parcels along Nonatuck Street east of um, Bliss remain general industrial when we modified the zoning a few years ago to take um, the parcels to the west out of GI and put it into OI. And so now this is sort of part two of that. Um, and at the same time, we're um, reevaluating the residential parcels and um, determining that it's probably more appropriate to uh, make the zoning match what the use is and what the future probable uses are there instead of having the mismatch between the zoning and the, the actual uses there. So the differences, so let me talk a little bit about general industrial versus office industrial. Over the years, uh, initially, they were much different, just not much different, but they had more differences than they had in common. And um, over the years, we've eliminated that difference as we we're trying to think about maybe um, consolidating the industrial zones just to have one industrial zone. However, there was some concern about... Um, and, and the biggest difference um, at this point is that office industrial allows residential uses above the first floor. So you could have mixed use where someone um, might have a studio space on the first floor, some kind of um, you know tech space or manufacturing space, but still want to live within the building and live upstairs. We don't allow that in general industrial. And there's also a more intense, um, in general industrial, it's more intense sort of large scale warehousing is allowed where typically that means you have lots of tractor trailers coming in. And these, as time has gone on, we used to have general industrial districts sort of all scattered throughout Florence and Northampton, but as, um, industry changed and trucks got really big and they really needed access to the interstate. Um, we've modified the zoning over time to take those, um, put it sort of more in a lighter industrial, I guess, um, classification where it's not so close to I-91. Mm -hmm. And so basically we have the, in the industrial park, which is on Damon Road, easy access to 91. And so there was um, an interest in, in preserving that and not mixing housing into that component and sort of cre leaving sort of a very traditional um, industrial um, zone there. And um, at the time that rezoning along Nonatuck Street from general industrial to office industrial was considered, um, there was some reticence to allow residential use in all of these um, parcels along Nonatuck Street. And I think that's why we didn't initially just rezone everything at once from general industrial to office industrial. Um, so now, because we um, this is um, precipitated by the fact that um, Bicam um, manufacturing is shutting down operations at that site and they're looking for um, new uses and office industrial allows a little bit more flexibility by in introducing that ability to have a residential component. And of course that, um, you know, it's on the edge, it's surrounded by re the residential districts. So um, that is, um, that's sort of what, how this conversation began is just look at that. And then we wanted to look at the other parcels that were also zoned industrial and see if they still made sense to be that same um, classification. And typically, so the, so in terms of the parcels that are being proposed to come out of industrial and go into residential, um, you know, for a, a long time, uh, the thinking was that you'd want smaller spaces for um, trades uses to be able to maybe have a combined uh, or or have a, a small cost 
effective or cost efficient space for people who uh, might need smaller spaces. And so we left these homes as industrial. But clearly, um, and so when you have a mismatch and there's a nonconformity, so a single family home is a nonconforming use in the industrial district. And when you continue to have that mismatch, um, what it says from a policy perspective is ultimately you want that property or that structure to be reused in the the zoning in which it's located. So um, I think given that, and when it's non-conforming, any modification to those residences requires coming to the zoning board for approval. So um, property owners, these are mostly single family homes. There's a couple of um, uh, multifamily, but Anytime um, there's a request to expand the residential structure or exp expand the number of units um, in these um, parcels here, that required an application to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, even if it was staying residential, if you're adding on, that would trigger a permit process. And so... Um, now, as sort of we've transitioned, you know, zoning is one of those things that um, sometimes evolves with time and is how uses um, come into being. So we think it's appropriate to say, you know what, we want to keep these as residential homes. They've been homes. They were sort of initially, um, you know, um, mill housing, um, essentially. And so why put, um, why make uh, barriers and impediments for people to continue to use them in the way they've historically been used. So that's sort of the reason why we're rethinking and, and proposing to put um, those parcels into residential. And so that's about it. Alex. Thanks. Um, thanks, Carolyn, for uh, both for that thorough explanation and also for working together with me, we are co-sponsoring this uh, ordinance, this change. I'm the Ward 5 counselor and together Carolyn and I have reached out to all of the affected property owners to uh, get feedback before we introduce this. Um, and um, I've also reached out to, to many constituents as well in, in the neighborhood and um, have heard um, so far positive uh, <clears throat> Positive feedback. Um, I think Carolyn described described all of the goals that that I that I share as well. Again, especially good to hear from you since it's your ward. Um, before I go to the um to, to the public, um, I make a first pass of any questions from anybody on planning board or the council, just for clarifying questions. Go ahead. Hey, Carolyn. Oh, yeah. Carolyn, what year was it that the first change portion, the change took place? Um, so the parcels to the west, he, maybe four or five years ago. I can look it up quickly. Okay, and, yeah. And yeah, it wasn't super long ago. Has there been any residential uh, housing uh, uh, use? appeared in those areas or would we know if there was um i don't think certainly in the um old um the non-tech mill i don't there's no residential use um pine street i think there is the pine 221 pine I believe there is residential use there, but I'm not sure if it's just oh. curious. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, Somebody out there. Sorry. Yes, Alex. Um, so yeah, right across the street from Bicam uh is the I think it was advertised as Northampton's first to live work. It's right behind the Dave, David Ruggles Center. Mm -hmm. And that that's oh, an off that's industrial. Crazy. And oh. there's um, workshops on the first floor of these, I think they're condos and residential above. Oh, cool. 
Good. So there's been some experimentation. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm actually not aware of any legal residential use in the non in the uh, 221 pine. Right. That's another question. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Yes, well, George. So, Carolyn, just I don't, I want to confirm that little triangle. Um, where Riverside joins South Maple, that's where uh, the coffee roasters are. Yeah. And that is turning, that used to be GI, and now that's going to OI also. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, we did approve, not too long ago, a residential, a second unit on South Maple Street for someone. I don't think they ever commenced that work, though, um, um, at that one of those large homes there, because it's a, an extra large lot. Right. And in fact, they um, are thinking about pursuing that project and but they've run out of you know they've run the clock out so they'll have to come uh, back let's see. if this is um adopted as proposed they would only need a planning board permit not planning board and zoning board so the last time they came through they needed both a planning board and a zoning board permit so just as a kind of a this may scenario somebody um the the medical building there to the well, let's call it the east yeah that's a large lot and a lot of woods there and that adjoins that house that we're talking about right so if somebody wanted to do a new um, office industrial space and combine those places they would have to come in and get a special or have a zoning change right to change that one from urb to oi that that lower lot where right where Riverside comes into South Maple. I'm just thinking of that large space there, which might be very attractive to somebody. So, I mean, yes, um, someone would have to come in. I'm sorry. So you're ta you're thinking about the space behind the medical office yeah. building. Yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it is all primarily wetlands. Ah, anyway. okay. So I don't think that would be. A um, a developable portion of the property. And all of these properties border on the Mill River, but that wetlands has no bearing on the uh, the OI unless they do build something and then they have to go to cons common all. Right. And there's floodplain associated with that too. So yep. any any expansion towards the river would trigger other permits. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Um so uh for, um, so we'll come back um, to any further discussions uh, here. Um, if there's anybody um, online or um, in the room that would like to speak to this issue, um, if it's help, it's helpful. Um, I don't know that we're going to have a ton of comment, but um, if when you come up, if you could um, say who you are and where you're from, and it's helpful if you um, could say kind of um, right out front if you know. Um, if you're opposed or are in favor of of the uh, the proposed um, change, um, so with that said, anybody? No. Oh, go ahead. Come forward. Sure, that's. Hi. Good evening. Hi, Alex. Um, he's my counselor. I live at 38 Will Street that abuts the uh, property. Um, I am a lawyer of 14 years. I'm also a professor slash lecturer of computer science at UMass. Um, hi, Carolyn, uh, too. Um, I am for the change, uh, preferably to a lighter, even lighter than um, the office industrial, preferably residential or, or a park. Um, I have a list of reasons. I don't want to get too scathing. And I'll have what couple minutes here. Uh for uh, hearing portion, we're not gonna limit your time. Um, you know, trying to repeat yourself. So generally speaking, um, and I have this written down, sorry for reading this, but um, many companies are nice to neighbors and you know, generally speaking, general general industrial will be fine, but not with this company and potentially other companies that come in. Uh, there is a list of bad things that happened here. There is formaldehyde found all over properties documented by Mass DEP. Um, you could take your finger and run it against employees' cars and uh, find formaldehyde dust on your finger. This was in the backyard where my three children play. Um, I found formaldehyde all over um, the uh, parking lot. There was zinc found in the water that was going down the Mill River 
into Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary, hurting um, tons and tons of wildlife. There was a ton of things that happened. And I guess I don't want to get into an ad nauseum comment here, but this couldn't be managed by the city. Um, there's public records go dating back almost a decade where people, neighbors reached out to the city and nobody did anything. In fact, our building inspector had an OSHA report from 2018 that said the building was about to explode. This is public record. You can go read it. Our city um, in, uh, building inspector did nothing about that. No documented anything. And again, there are emails upon emails. There are phone calls upon phone calls. And changing zoning is not the way you're supposed to deal with these situations, right? It's supposed to be the city. It's supposed to be Mass DEP. It's supposed to be EPA. But it didn't happen at the city level. And there was so much disjunction that nothing could happen. And I understand this is a different view that you're looking for. But what I'm telling you is, like, the city cannot handle uh, these types of companies. So please do not let another company come in. I support a lower use than um, general industrial, ideally residential or a park. Um, but please do not keep this general industrial. I should just one more mention, this is also a historical landmark. This is where Sojourner Truth put her actual building when she came here, and now it's just a dump. Um, so just a little side note to that. Again, I support um, changing this to a lighter use, preferably even lighter than um, office industrial. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank and you. what was your name? Um, Marvin Cable. I figured you all knew who I am because I'm one of the entities behind I do, yeah. Uh, thank you for your um, advocacy, Mr. Cable. Yeah. Certainly I'm aware of it. Um, is there uh, anybody else in the room or online who wish to speak to this? Go ahead. Come on. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Papuchas. I live at 113 Nonatuck Street. Um, I'll keep this very short. Uh, I'm really glad to see the city having a discussion about this. I agree with the gentleman who came before me that um, zoning this as uh, residential or a park would be a brilliant idea. I would invite the city to consider, as the gentleman mentioned, that that's actually the, the, the land that the original community sat on. Um, that's a historic site that could be of tremendous value for Florence as a cultural hub, walking tours, local history, as well as residences. Uh, use it to celebrate the Mill River, which has so much tremendous history. Um, so I would I would support the the change, but encourage the city uh, to have it be residential in a park and really use it as um, a, a place to celebrate Florence history and the uniqueness of Florence. Um, it's a gem of a place that that little park, I think that triangular shaped park is the original community green in Florence from my understanding of the history. And what a wonderful place to potentially also have the city feature some of the local history um, with the Ruggles Center, uh, historic Northampton could be part of those trail systems bring a lot of people in really support the community in in amazing ways so um, that's my that's what I have to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> anybody online? Somebody, there was some indication there was somebody online, but oh, uh, Lindsay Davison. Uh, let me. Um, hello, I'm Lindsay Davison. I live at 35 Bliss, and I just wanted to third. Um, uh, Marvin and the uh, the person who spoke before um, the certainly less industrial but ideally residential and park that uh, prioritizes sort of the socio historical cultural um, aspect of this of this area um, and also as a parent with three children in the neighborhood privy to the very hard work of my neighbors who have um, <clears throat> uh, where I have learned more about some of the incredibly egregiously problematic behaviors of industry in that area. Um, I think I just want to 
I want to support the efforts to um, have less industry and in this time of real um, uh, access to housing issues, uh, really consider that that be the priority um, as well. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, I did, I skipped over somebody online uh, to call on somebody in the room because I didn't see a hand. So I will call on uh, to. Uh, I apologize, Tusi, Tusi uh, Gaston Guay. I'm Hi. sorry if I said that terribly. Yeah. That's okay. Yes, Tusi Gaston Gay, and I live um, on Willow Street uh, near this uh, project, and I totally support uh, the rezoning. But I do have a question, and I don't know if this was addressed because I didn't hear everything that was said early on in the presentation. I uh, with the. I think this is like the huge, the biggest formaldehyde tank in the state uh, that's sitting there, and also with the, with the horrible um, leakage that has been happening with formaldehyde. Are there plans to do a complete cleanup of this before anybody lives there? Thank you very much. And um, we'll uh, come back to questions um, after everybody's spoken, but we'll make a, a note of, of your question, okay? Um, anybody in the room who, yep, come on forward. Hi, I'm Malcolm Harper. I'm at one, uh, 105 Willow Street, and I concur with the previous comments. I think that it's vital that we consider a lower impact at best, residential or park or combination. That'd be great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bounce back to Zoom. Anybody online? All right. Uh, I'm going to make another call in the room. Anybody else out there want to, want to speak to this? All right. Um, so I guess I'll come back um, uh, and maybe Carolyn, you, you're maybe on the hook as the person here if, if you have an answer, if you know anything about, um, although I also wonder about um, building, you know, the uh, building inspector and any kind of enforcement issues, if you know of anything going on and a little off topic of the zoning per se, but if you have any insight in that. Um, I think the issue is, is, um, a jurisdictional issue. So the, um, there are certain things that the building, um, department and fire, um, have enforcement, um, action over, and then other, um, issues are purely state or federal. Um, and uh, so I, that there's that piece in terms of cleanup again that's a that's going to be or, or bringing you know um the property to a level that would comply with all the standards for residential use or any use is going to be under the jurisdiction of the state and federal entities yeah um okay um so I'm going to make one more call for any uh, from the public, and also uh, I'd include you, Carolyn, um, if there's anything else that you want to add or any questions you feel like weren't answered. Anybody? Okay. Um, so having heard from the public and from Carolyn, um, I would uh, uh, close the um, close the hearing, and then we can have discussion. Or I'd ask for a motion to. I would move to close the hearing. Second. Uh, do we, you guys don't stand on formality. Do you need the, the, the separate yeah, motion? We probably would. We, okay. would we, would, we would have a motion to close the public hearing after you finish your vote on it. Okay. Be two separate things, so. uh, because we're all here. Uh, any, all in favor of closing, uh, say aye. Thank aye. You. And none are opposed. So uh, for count, for the list, we're closed for that portion. And for the planning board, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Yes, sir. Moved by Janet, seconded by we'll Rich Baker. Thanks. Any discussion? All those in favor of closing the public hearing? All right, unanimous. 
All right. So uh, open up to discussion uh, for us folks. Just to follow up a little bit on the last uh, uh, observation by Carolyn about formalities and who's the jurisdiction of clean up brownfields, things like that. Any kind of reuse of this large factory space would probably entail a uh, at least a site uh, a site plan permit application that some of that would get vetted during that time. If this if this change went into place, um, if this zoning change went into place, um, yes. Yeah. So there would, I, I think, if there's a proposal for a reuse of the property, it most likely would trigger a planning board review under site plan. So um, the parking and landscaping and sort of the whole um, area in front of the building, as well as um, lighting and access issues um, for the use of the building or the reuse of the building would require planning board review. But um, your review would be targeted at those um, requirements in the zoning ordinance relative to site plan and meeting those performance standards, but not... Um, you know, any cleanup that would be required to bring it to a level that would be safe for new use and whether it's residential or any other office use, you know, any business that wants to move into the space would want presumably assurances that it was safe for them to, you know, bring their business. Yeah. Alex. So what would trigger, so it sounds like it would be a state or federal inspection or what what would trigger that process is that something that you know the, the property owners will be required to do because we it's known what the past use was and and the various complaints or is that is that built into the process or is that something where someone may have to file a complaint um you know, I haven't looked at the reports that finally when there was action, enforcement action taken, I don't know if there was as part of that a path provided for the owner to make sure that the whole property was cleaned up. I don't know if that's built into that enforcement action or not. Um, and um, Um, so I guess I don't really have a good answer about how, you know, if it wasn't, um, how would anybody know, you know, whether or not they're burying dust? Um, <laughs> I, can, I wonder I can, if we know anybody. I can speak to this a little bit, having worked at D Mass DEP. Um, a lot of things would come in as a complaint, um, and I don't know where this site stands i haven't looked it up on your mass dep um in whether or not it's a listed site um the other thing that often prompts um something to come up to the state is um when a, an industrial property is sold banks always require um an environmental site assessment and based on what's found there it's either reportable to the state or not um so that will come in and usually it's required that the current owner and this is usually done like a bank doesn't want to lend money to somebody who's buying a contaminated property. So that's often how it would come about. So if they're looking to sell the site, um, that's typically how it would come into the state for the state to even know about it. So, but I don't know if there have been complaints made to Mass DEP or not. So that they might know, they might already know that something's going on. So, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And just to follow up on that, I think. In the scenario where the property owner remains the same and just as an investor, I think probably to your point, if um, bank financing was necessary to um, pursue renovation, then there may be some trigger as well. So if it's not a land sale, but there's, um, you know, lending on the property, that might also be a trigger. Alex? Um, oh, sorry. You look like you were. Well, just you know, we we have we have a, a a lot of there's a lot of interest in what will happen with this property, and I think there'll be a lot of eyes on it. 
Um, so I'm, I feel, I feel confident that we'll, we'll get the necessary complaints if we're not seeing the, you know, the, the necessary uh, due diligence to make sure it's clean. Go, go ahead, George. I just want to check in on the on the zoning map and especially the the three residential parcels that are currently GI, and we're asking to have them move into URB because you know it's it's kind of like gerrymandering in these zoning maps. Sometimes when they go in and out and in and out, and it, if they stayed what they were, or if they moved to OI, so it was one continuous block of OI zoning. The the uh, impact on those three residences is anytime they want to do anything to their house, they have to go, they have to file a permit with the zoning board of anything of, of some large nature. They have to be extra, small, even small. Yeah. They have to jump through a hoop to, to get that done. Yeah. And more, and, and it is, it abuts the urban residential B. So it's not an Island um, because everything North of that is urban residential. Across the B. Street. Yeah. Um, and, and just um, the other piece of it is, again, sort of going back to that policy um, sort of statement without saying it, mm -hmm. you know, the zoning is representative of the um, direction that the city intends land to be used, right? So um, keeping it industrial is um, identifying that as something where the city intends and wants this to remain industrial. So I just don't, um, I don't know that that's the, uh, um, a factor anymore. I think it it probably, I think um, that I wouldn't say that certainly from a planning perspective, it makes sense to, to continue to push these to convert to industrial uses. Because it, our city inventory of industrial parcels is kind of small at this point. Is that what we're saying? No, I think this type of parcel for industrial uses is too small for industrial uses. And um, and historically, they've been residential. And so I think that um, it's not likely that they would be, um, that there's value in being an industrial property. Okay. Thanks. Um, any, any, anybody else? Any further questions or deliberation? Um, one more time. So, <laughs> just, just you know what? Or, I'm going to let Jana. Oh, I didn't even. Okay, I didn't see it. It was. It was. I a, just wanted it was to a, talk about process. <laughs> I'm going to make motions. But. Well, in which case, then let's hear from Jana, and then we'll talk process. I was just going to say that I'm in favor of the proposal. I think we, I mean, we all know we need more housing in the city. And if this would, after cleanup and all of these things, potentially make that possible um, and provide a pathway for, you know, maintaining some houses that are already there and potentially expanding on them and so forth, I think that can only be a good thing. So just in terms of process, it's kind of laid out to us as ordinance A and B. But I think we'll be making a, a the planning board makes a recommendation to city council on the what's stated as uh, 24.152 in ordinance to rezone eight GI and three OI parcels in Florence. Right. But, okay. We don't have to break it down into these are going to URB. Unless you wanted to, unless there was a separate, you know, some reason to say, well, we recommend this one, but not the other. Right. I think I would, you know, t take the motion and, 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 uh, unless there was some need to break it up or somebody was suggesting that we could discuss that. Um, I, uh, before I, um, ask for a motion, I would just also echo, uh, Ms. White's comment, um, which is to say, I'm glad to hear from Councilor Jarrett that, um, uh, the, you know, thank you for the work that you did with planning board to work through this issue uh, for everybody in the community who's advocated to bring attention to this particular property. This doesn't answer all of those questions, but you very rightly um, concerned um, about the situation. And I, I hope that there can be continued um, progress on that. Um, and I am always all for um, uh, housing, you know, and making 
expanding what is available for housing and to make uh, it more possible for those of, you know, for, for these lots that already are housing to be like the rest of the city <laughs> and be able to do um, and, and have the opportunities um, with their homes and to expand their uses um, as, as everybody else. So um, I, I, I'm fully in favor of this. Um, so with that said, I if, have a motion from anybody on the legislative matters. Move for a positive recommendation. I'll second that. Um, and we have to do a roll call vote on this one, <laughs> right? Uh, no, I don't think so. Cause that, that's just, we only have to do roll call votes when we're actually passing an ordinance. Okay. All right. This is just a recommendation. All right. Uh, very good. Well, in which case, uh, all in favor of a positive recommendation to council on right, say aye. 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 And there are none opposed. So that will go uh, back to council with a positive recommendation from legislative matters. Planning well, board's turn. Is there a motion for a recommendation? Are these only changes? <laughs> oh, here I have. I here. I couldn't pull it up here. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. It's not just. Uh, I move to positively recommend the proposed uh, zoning changes from GI to OI and OI to URB as discussed. Great. Is there a second? Any discussion? More discussion. All right. All those in favor? Any opposed? No, it's unanimous. All right, very Thanks, good. Thanks, everyone. Uh, <laughs> oh, that should happen more often, I need to say. <laughs> I know, wow. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Alex? Uh, so the, this will be taken up on November 7th, city council meeting for a vote. Uh, yeah, so for yeah. folks who are leaving, yeah. It's, it's just been recommended. Yeah. As another public hearing also. No, nope, no public hearing, no just public the hearing. vote. This was the, the end hearing. of the public hearing. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so with that, uh, could I have a motion to adjourn the uh, joint portion for the Legislative Matters uh, Committee meeting? Yes, I move to adjourn. Second. Uh, there's no discussion on adjournment. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 There are none opposed. We leave you to your work. <laughs> How did that happen? Kayla, get out of there. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't figure out how to get Please. I can't. I can't. There's something wrong. I don't know because I'm not the host. I can't access that. Yeah. Mm. Here, I'll see if I can do it. Good. That's better. I couldn't do it. But it's still just me. Yeah. Well, we'll start. Tech problems. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for your patience as we finished up that joint hearing. Welcome to the October 24th planning board hearing.
uh, Northampton Planning Board. Um, we have just one item on the agenda today, which is a continuation of a uh, October 10th major site plan for a 9,000 less plus or minus uh, 500 square feet of 12 unit residence by Stephen Nibala at 408 Pleasant Street, map ID 32C 1H7. We continued this from just two weeks ago, I believe, because of a little glitch with the uh, um, the public announcements. Um, so we've heard we had a great presentation by the applicant and his team, and uh, the planning board had an opportunity to ask them questions. The public had a chance to comment. The public hearing, the public portion is still open, so you'll get another chance. But hopefully, we won't go over all of the same items that we discussed before. Um, I think the main things that <clears throat> were still kind of up in the air, some of the main things had to do with uh, um, access, um, pedestrian access to the site. Um, I think we talked through the lighting plan, um, some things that would be delivered um, at the time of the final plans. Um, we talked a little bit about um, evidence of uh, plans for snow storage, um, bicycle parking, and uh, bike racks, and the uh, yeah the entrance off of uh, Pleasant Street. Um, we also talked about the roof, the the height of the roof, and the um, details there, which will be addressed also in the state in the plans because much of this comes under our new gateway zoning, which. To be honest, the planning board is still getting used to those some of those requirements and emphasis. So um, we'll work through some of those again tonight. So um, the applicant's ready to give another kind of summary of the plan, and so is the new plans, revised plans. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Jeff Squire from Berkshire Zen Group uh, here on behalf of the applicant. Um, yeah, as you know, just sort of here to summarize the major changes that have happened since we were here last. Um, I do have um, um, an updated set of plans that addresses um, the majority of the items, um, many of which were associated with some of the DPW comments um, and particularly the, the major uh, sewer line drainage easements um, behind the property. There was also a, uh, a wall that the DOT, the railroad, recently built on the property to retain some of that hillside. That turns out that, that was just a little bit more on this property than they were supposed to. So what that meant was just a slight twist to the, um, that rear parking lot. So let me show you, um, so which is, sorry guys. Um, and so this set of plans reflects, you can see that wall in this drawing here, property line is just in the back of it. So that's a separate issue, but we were able to take this plan and slightly adjust the parking lot um, with a, you know, sort of a twist in, in this section right here to accommodate that wall. So still have the same dimensions, same general areas. Um, we did uh, widen this walk um, as was suggested in the last hearing um, and to make this accessible as so we opened up this a little bit so that this is all Sorry, at is your mic on? Uh, is it now yes <laughs> um apologies um so we did widen this walk between the two buildings this is all shown as a replaced walk uh open this up so that this is all at grade now to facilitate you know accessible access into the building. Um, we also updated the plan to add another bike rack. Um, there's a covered uh, bike storage um, oop, uh, place in that same patio area. We just oriented everything 90 degrees. So this is a covered um, bike parking space in that in that area. Um, other changes, yeah, as I said, we're really related to some of the DP addressing some of the DPW comments. Um, and um, I think those are the major major updates. <clears throat> Ask a question. You, 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 the public will have a chance pretty soon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, any 
clarifying questions any clarifying questions from the planning board and just a highlighter an image of this here is what you know we're we're looking at for that bike storage area you know again it's a small relatively small space but something that offers some shelter over those those bike racks <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to clarify, I communicated with um, Jeff about the sidewalk dimensions that are required in the CBG district. So they were originally shown as four, but um, he's aware that that, that plan set need, would need to be changed to comply to six feet because it's in an urban district. So that walk leading back from yeah present. yeah and I guess all all I would add is just again this is you know this is an internal walk I recognize I fully recognize the the zoning bylaw and ordinance and the intent um, there's 18 residents two of which will have access to units from the front so you know it's really just an internal circulation walkway so you know six feet on a relatively small site with valuable green space you know means something um, you know we can certainly make this work it's going to be tight there's going to be a lot of you know, concrete, a lot of sidewalk where maybe not needed, but that's, I understand that. So just wanted to offer that as a, you know, it's, it's four feet wide, wider than it is now. And, you know, certainly sufficient enough to accommodate, you know, the, the, the amount of traffic that we anticipate that that would receive most of it into the parking lot. But um, yeah, so <clears throat> I'm aware of the, aware of the requirement and we can, we can make it work. What is our uh, requirement in the gateway district for green space for open space? And did you do it? We well, we partially we made up for you know we have actually we should redo the calculation, but we lost you know this section of sidewalk that was on the north side of the building because of that where the retaining wall is located. So there's probably a net you know uh, increase in green space with this plan. So we can we can adjust that and and provide that updated you know open space requirement. I don't remember offhand, Carolyn, in that district, what percentage it is. Um, I know we've gone back and forth with a number of applications about those calculations. So in this district, so there's, um, it's just about meeting the buffer zone requirements as opposed to a set um, open space, minimum open space. I'm just double checking that though, yeah. So it's not, it's more about making sure that they're, our screening protections for the parking as opposed to targeting a minimum percentage of open space. So what's helpful about the wider sidewalks, I'm sure is also during the winter time, mm -hmm. um, especially if somebody is in a wheelchair or um, so, and and you've looked again at the plans around snow storage, you feel comfortable with what you have. And yes. We did provide, um, I was going to think of other thing I was going to, um, we did also include a snow storage um, plan, um, if you will. Um, let's see. You know, visible. Yeah. So uh, again, this is obviously a, you know, an infill urban site. So there are some limited space to push snow. Um, we recognize that, you know, a bunch of that space on the right side of the drive as you come in is part of the railroad property, but it's a big flat face at the base of their hill that somebody would push snow. And so, um, you know, the, the reality of it is that's where we will end up in the most common storms, I imagine. Um, the bigger storms, just like any other, you know, large, um, you know, uh, are more densely filled uh, urban site that it gets removed off site. Um, if there's enough snow, but there is, there is some green space on, on, on the, on the existing site to maintain some, some snow, snow storage. All right. To reopen up the public comment. All right. So at this point, if you'd like to come forward and speak either in favor or in opposition to the application. Please do so and just give us your name and your address. That would be great. And then just confirm, you said at the beginning, this is like you just took like a 10 minute break. So the comments that were made at the previous hearing don't need to be repeated. They're still part of the record. We'll start with city council chambers and here, yeah. 
uh, Robin Powers uh, at City View Condominiums at 8 Hockenham Road, which is actually right on the other side of the railway track. Um, I guess, well, one question was, how long is that driveway? Just out of curiosity, because I it's a small space, and the way it looks on the plan, I couldn't tell. It looks like the driveway is fairly long going into the parking lot. So that was my one question. Uh, sure, we'll we'll find out what that is. I, I'm not sure why it's pertinent to the application, the length of the driveway. It's probably not, but it's it's pertinent to how it affects our building, um, how far back, how how far recessed that driveway is. I'm I'm sorry, your building is on the other side of the railroad track? The other side of the railroad track, yeah. And this driveway is on on the Pleasant Street side of the railroad right. tracks. Right. So the lights from cars won't impact you. I'm well, I understand your the, concern. The back windows of the building, if it's three stories high, might be like looking right down into our back windows, for one thing. And then there was also concern, which may have been brought up at the last meeting, that um, the light the lights, depending on what sort of light fixtures they put in, might be impacting the back windows uh, of our building. Great. Thank you. So we'll make sure to talk through those concerns before we wrap up. And I think, too, just a general concern about very large structures being built downtown on small lots We've had a number of these that have happened over the past couple of years. The Live 155, the Lumberyard Building. There's been a very large building, which is eight condo units, which was built on a site of a single family home. And and I I guess I don't I don't really I understand that there is a need for housing and that the city wishes to pursue this infill um philosophy for small spaces but i think it is at a certain point it's really is affecting quality of life downtown to have these very large structures which aren't really reflective or they don't fit in with the existing housing or neighborhood that's my last comment <laughs> thank you, thank you. Would anyone else like to comment? <clears throat> uh, Benjamin Spencer I'm on Rust Avenue in Northampton. Um, I spoke at the last meeting, you know, very much in support of this project. I think it's great to see um, residential building going into the Gateway District. I think this is a very exciting project. Um, what came up in the last meeting and that would just sort of keeps knocking around in, in my head is that this is, you know, basically the back of the building facing the street, Pleasant Street and um, Hockenham. And it is very much, you know, by its sighting, um, what you see is you enter town um, in the gateway. And so um, it's got discussed a, li a little bit at the last meeting, and I'm, I'm loathe to to play architect at uh, these meetings, but I can't help but think that it might be really kind of a fun design element to include to include in the facade the appearance of uh, an entrance that would go into a lobby or something like that, or or the appearance of that one existed at one time, and it could just be you know Disney World, but it could still be kind of an effective architectural, uh, you know, attractive um, component to the building. And and I do think, you know, something to make it less apparent that it's the back of the building facing the street would be something I'd consider if I was designing it. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Hello, Danny McCann, uh, 32 Perkins Ave. As I said last time, I, I do think this is, on the whole, a pretty nice proposal, appropriate info location, nice looking building. Um, one thing that they were asked last time to come back with was a bit more of a plan for pedestrian access. And it is a little bit better, for sure. 
Um, but I think, you know, sort of at the back, the idea that people are going to walk, I think particularly for pedestrians, this may not apply as much to, to maybe walk, you know, cycling up on that, that sidewalk. <clears throat> If, if that happens, which I'm, I'm sure it will, because it's the shortest path to downtown. Um, but, you know, particularly for pedestrians, in order to get to the back of the building, your entrance off of Pleasant Street, you walk up the sidewalk and then you actually have to kind of overshoot by quite a bit to get all the way to your parking lot almost. And then you take a right and go back towards the building, you know, so it seems like there's going to be, and I realize there's a retaining wall there. Um, I just wonder if it would be possible to ask them to put a couple of steps and a sidewalk that kind of uh, cuts off that corner a little bit at minimum for pedestrians. Um, and also, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal for cyclists, probably whoever's there should, you know, bike around, but but if you were to accommodate cyclists, you could use, you know, one of those like rails where you can just kind of, you know, walk downstairs and and have a rail for your bicycle to go up or down it. And, you know, maybe even maybe even place bicycle storage there instead. So your main pedestrian and bike route in and out of that building is going to be kind of, you know, looking at the picture, kind of like out your door to the left grab your bike or walk past the bikes, go straight out to Pleasant Street is probably what the real circulation route is for people who are not leaving and coming on, you know, un unless they're obviously by car, they are coming in and out the back, but, but base pedestrians and cyclists are going to be going to, through the middle of these buildings to Pleasant Street almost all the time, I think, un unless they're, you know, taking a walk out Hawking them Road. But most of the time, most of their destinations are in that direction. And it does seem like this plan could maybe think a little bit harder about how to make this easier for pedestrians to, to really make sense. But I will say, as far as the requirement for a six foot sidewalk, that seems a little bit absurd. It is it is an internal walkway to this building for 16 units, um, even five five feet seems a little this is not i understand that there's an ada requirement for public sidewalks to be five feet but should that be the requirement for inter, internal walkways and in small residential developments i think that that maybe it would be worth revisiting some of those requirements thank you thanks carolyn would that require a waiver from the six foot requirement would that be like a stated waiver? Um, yeah, and you'd want to specify. I mean, four feet is pretty narrow for mobility devices, people who in wheelchairs, and certainly going downstairs won't work so well for right. mobility devices. Other comments? <clears throat> uh, David Ames, uh, Round Hill Road. Um, just, I think it was great that uh, more consideration was given to bikes and that, you know, covered storage. I think um, bikes are a form of transportation and not just a recreational activity. So I think it was great that more consideration was given to the covered storage, bike storage in that uh, new project. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Carolyn, I can't see if there's any hands raised in... Uh... Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know what happened here? Um, no, I, there are no hands raised. Okay. No, nobody out in the Zoom world. Is there other comments here from council chambers? Well, we'll we'll come back in a minute. Um, other questions from the uh, planning board members? I, I, you know, I'll speak to the <clears throat> concerns from across the the railroad tracks here from that other large complex. Um, there will be a lighting plan. Um, none of the lights are allowed to really escape the um, perimeter of uh, any development like this. Um, so that will be monitored for sure. Um, there is another, and in terms of people looking from your from their third store windows across the railroad tracks to your windows. I I can't say how that's going to happen. There's already an existing three-story building just on the other side of this parcel. Um, and I'm not sure if they also have that vantage point, but this is what this height is what we allow in this district. Um, so and and it's not as tall as other buildings in town, but 
Um, so I appreciate that. And yes, we'll we on all of the projects, we're very careful about the lighting that's used, and all the developers are very consistent with the, the new Northampton lighting ordinances. So it should be protected there. Um, any more on that sidewalk piece? Are folks in favor of um, moving it down to six feet to create a little bit more green space? I mean, moving it down to five feet from six to create some more space. Any feeling? So I think what we heard one comment is in many grassy areas, people walking will just cut across an open space. I think that's what we heard from one comment. Um, in the back of, thanks, right. So it would be right. Can you zoom in there? Jeff? Yeah, and I can explain a couple of challenges. Yep. Um, one is that the building uh, related, this is all living space. So uh, there's first floor living space right there. So to have people walking right by your window um, with bikes and downstairs is a little bit intrusive. Um, there's also a low point here just because this building that's adjacent that exists there now sits quite a, feet, quite a few feet higher. And so part of the reason for that retaining wall and that change in grade is to facilitate where this building needs to sit relative to Hockenham Road, um, which is at uh, quite a bit of a different elevation. So, you know, part of that necessitated the need for a low point here. So there is a drain there. Um, you know, if you don't really have the ability to raise that up much. So it'd just be an awkward place to bring people into, um, you know, with those few things going on. So I, I fully recognize, you know, the desire lines, this, you know, ultimately may get rounded over um, just because there will be a goat path there. Um, I think, you know, this, we're anticipating that, that people are going to take that desire line and take the path of least resistance. So I, I imagine this will be one of those things in the field as, as those walks are getting formed up that will, you know, those angles may get softened a little bit, but that would, you know, that's largely going to be where that connection needs to happen for those other reasons, I think. You're able to do this without stairs. Yes. You're able to provide this. This is all accessible, right? Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Is there, are there any plantings along the. And there are, yeah, that is building? that, that entire. To discourage people to walk that way. So there is, there is, you know, series of, you know, um shrubs but also a, a, a more herbaceous ground cover a wildflower you know so there's some height there that you know is intended to discourage that yeah yeah i think this was a this is a good change i'm i'm happy with it. yeah and personally and i think as a cyclist too if my bike is under that covered lot i would tend to get on and go right out the driveway yeah and then too. grab the mm -hmm. bike path george and then grab the bike path that's on Pleasant Street there. Is that multi-use path instead of riding on the sidewalk? Yeah, right. Sure, we certainly wouldn't want to encourage people to ride their bikes on the sidewalk. Um, could you go to the front elevations on Pleasant yes. Street so we could just look at those doorways again? And there were updated elevations that were included. Uh, sorry. Um, just to highlight some of the changes in... Um, yeah, particularly the roof roof dimensions. So those are all. And those two doorways we see go into uh, one private residence. Mm -hmm. I mean, they each go lead into a private residence. Right. And they're not tucked around a corner they they are this is re this is recessed here um there is an overhang above i believe oops i'm sorry um you can see some of that here so in plan view that doorway is tucked in the back here i mean to me that reveal kind of acts as a kind of a large opening entryway that maybe was kind of infilled for residential later mm -hmm. you know i don't think it's out of character with you know the intent of the gateway i think the rendering does it better justice than these elevations do. Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know 
Put those in here. Uh huh. All right, so it shows some of that reveal. <clears throat> We've come a long way with renderings. Yes, sir. I know. It's just after a rain. Yeah, yeah. it's very warm and inviting. Just a push of a button these days, isn't it? Okay. Other items to clarify. So notes from the staff mentioned that, uh, you know, prior to the issuance of a building permit, uh, the final plans need to show compliance with design standards as presented in the hearing meeting that the roof line has a differentiated element, which I believe they've done. Um, they've shown an exterior bike storage with at least one more bike loop and covered, which is great. Um, and then prior to uh, uh, the issuance of a CO, uh, compliance with exterior lighting standards with a stamped as built plan, which then shows us the 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 lighting outputs, and compliance with tree planning standards either through on-site planning or a combination of on-site and payment in lieu of. So, so we've heard from the public. Um, thanks for your 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 uh, concerns and your your drawings and uh, thoughts to help move this along. Appreciate that. Um, any other questions for the applicants team? All one of him. All right. There motion to close the public hearing. I would like to move to close the public hearing. All right. Motion made by Chris Tate, seconded by Rich Baker. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. All right. Any more discussion? Do we have to talk sidewalk, internal sidewalk? Yeah, sure. Any thoughts? I don't have a strong opinion about this. That's my thought. I mean, I think if four feet is really pushing it for mobility devices, I think we need to go bigger, five or six, but I don't have strong thoughts on five or six. So that's going to make a big major difference. Carolyn, did you, somebody said the ADA requirement is five? Um, so typically you need, well, minimum is um, three feet is for, you know, dimensions <laughs> for a wheelchair. Um, and then for public sidewalk is five. Um, so, and in this case, I think that, um, I mean, yes, it's an internal walk. I think that with snow or ice build up on the edges that starts to shrink it. So I don't think it, I would not recommend going below five. Although given its location here, it, you know, it might make, it's not, it's definitely not a high volume um, path, um, like, you know, a through way between two streets in the core of downtown where you might get a lot of pedestrians. It'd probably be maintained better than most sidewalks downtown and in my neighborhood. Um, so I'm okay with uh, with the five feet, and I think that'll give us a, the applicant a little bit more room to play with things, a little bit more green space. Um, I think much as we love everybody to be pedestrians and cyclists, and a great majority of the people who live here may use their cars and not set foot on that sidewalk, but. 
All right. So then that's a condition of, uh, you know, that's a waiver that we're granting the applicant. So their plans would show, the final plans would show a five-foot sidewalk to the internal one. They're still making some modifications to the other sidewalk in front of the building, um, which will be standard street size. Um, all right. And uh, the trees, you know, um, we need at least 29 inches to be replanted um, and should be specified in a standard condition and requiring a check for compliance prior to a CO. They confirmed on their plans, the covered bike storage, and we'll expect a, a stamped as-built lighting plan confirming compliance with the lighting standards prior to the CO also. So I guess those are conditions for us. All right. Anything else? All right, is someone ready to make a motion? Okay, I'll uh, move that we approve the major site plan for 408 Pleasant Street, map ID 32C-187 per the... Um, the two conditions previously noted, the site lighting and the trees, and then also uh, with the waiver uh, for a five-foot internal sidewalk. Well done. Is there a second? A second. All right. Motion made by Melissa Fowler, seconded by Chris Tate. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any abstentions? I was not able to review the tape from last time, so I abstain. Okay. So we are uh, five in favor, one abstention. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing this done in 16 months or so. <laughs> if this weather continues, we might have that happen. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for okay. coming tonight. Thank you. <laughs> What else do we have? We have a couple of uh, administrative things. We have a minute, or no, maybe she didn't come out from October 10th. Nope. I did not we'll do get it. those next time. But we have an AR. All right. Um, so this um, approval not required is really just a swap of um, land um, or a yeah a donation of land, 368 square feet on Blackberry Lane. It's in the back. So it was just this odd little finger that was part of this one parcel and it's going to be joined with this parcel, I'll show you on the, um, let's see if this works here. I'll show you what it looks like now. In these lots, um, stop share, hold on. Blackberry Lane is up on the way to Park Hill Orchards? No, it's actually right behind Jackson Street School. Oh. Um, so here, I'll just zoom in. Um, it's wild country back there. <laughs> um, okay, so drum roll. Okay, um, so here's Jackson Street School. Um, and there's this little funky strip right here. Um, so they'll just put draw a line here and transfer it over. This is Google Earth Pro. I want this. Man. Yeah. You want to zip around? No. <laughs> <laughs> all right. If I had a choice, I would be all for making the city more rectilinear. <laughs> since I don't have a choice, I move to endorse the ANR. Second. 
Motion to be made by Chris Tate, seconded by Jana White to endorse the ANR at on Blackberry Lane. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. All right. I think that's it. Yes, I don't have minutes. Anything so. exciting two weeks from now? No, we'll motion to adjourn <laughs> before we get into that. Not allowed to talk about that. That's right. Uh, well, actually, we have an extra Thursday in October. It's Halloween, so it's actually three weeks till the next meeting. Oh, okay. right, it's wild. Yeah, but it's always the second and fourth. Right, second and fourth. Right, but it's three weeks until the second. Next Thursday is October thirty first. I see. So, I see. yeah. Wow. So we meet again on the fourteenth. Yes. Um. So, um, motion to adjourn at seven fifty. So moved. And is there a second? All right, all those in favor. We be in. Uh, unanimous. <laughs>